good morning, everyone. If you could go ahead and open your Bibles to John chapter 5. John chapter 5. All right, last week as we gathered, we covered verses 18 through 24. Uh, John chapter 5, verses 18 through 24. And as we noted last week, Jesus is before the Pharisees. And John chapter 5, like someone noted, we're going through the book of John kind of quickly. Some of the chapters you can go kind of quickly. Uh, some of them you cannot go that quickly. Let me turn my mic down just a little bit uh, back there. Uh, and this is one of those that will take multiple sermons to get through John chapter 5. So it's going in kind of increments or five or six verses or so. Uh, so last, John chapter 5 is a pretty big chapter. Uh, we see that Jesus has deliberately gone to a pool where the uh, severely handicapped would be placed. There was a, a, a rumor, you might say, a wives' tale, something to that effect, uh, that where they believed that if an angel would stir the water every now and then, and the first one in could be healed. Uh, there's nothing else that states that this is actually the case. And we've even looked at uh, the original manuscript. If you go back to that early in chapter 5, you'll see that you're, if you have an ESV right now in front of you, there's a skip between verse 3 and verse 5. There is no verse 4 there. So that was, that was some things that were there that were, were not in the original manuscript, editor's notes that were kind of added to that. But here we have Jesus who deliberately, intentionally goes to a man 38 years old, uh, tells him to get up, uh, pick up your mat, and walk. He is instantly, immediately, fully healed and does exactly what Jesus says to do. He has no faith in Jesus at all, but yet he is healed. He does not even know who Jesus is. He doesn't know that he's the Messiah. He does not know that he is God incarnate. Uh, Jesus meets him later at the temple, and there the, the introduces himself fully because apparently the man learns Jesus' name. The Pharisees ask the man, what is he doing carrying his mat and walking because it is the Sabbath? As we've noted a couple of weeks ago, it was not just any Sabbath. This was a feast celebration. So what that would mean for the Pharisees is they are on high alert. They have their binoculars out, their judgmental binoculars, looking for anyone who could possibly have come in from out of town, as all the Jewish pilgrims were manda had to do for these feasts, if there were anyone, if there was anyone breaking the rules. And they find one, one man carrying a mat. So that's where they go to him, and, uh, and later he says, no, I'm following the orders of the one who told me to do this. Pharisees go to Jesus, right? So that kind of catches us up here. Jesus says, I am doing this. Why am I doing this? I am working on the Sabbath. He admits to working on the Sabbath. Why can he work on the Sabbath? Because he is God in the flesh. He says, for the very same reason my father is working, I am working now. Okay, and so the Pharisees there in verse 18, we see if they catch on to this, that he is claiming equality with God. He is referring to God as his father. We take that term for granted these days. You may even pray when you pray in personal prayer time, uh, perhaps dear heavenly father or heavenly father, and you start your prayer off that way. That is not the way the Jews started off any prayer. They would not do that. All right. Now we are adopted into the family of God and call can call God Abba Father. Jesus is not adopted in. He is the true Son of God, God the Son incarnate. So when he says Father, they realize what he's doing. He's making himself equal to God. He's working on the Sabbath, etc. Now, as we've looked at last week, verses 18 through 24, Jesus just builds on this further and claims that he is the author of life. <clears throat> he can work on the Sabbath day because God works. God is his heavenly Father. Uh, he claims to be God the Son. He claims to obey God perfectly, all right, and that he is the author of spiritual and physical life and that he is the judge of all mankind. So what they thought he was saying, he doubles down, triples down, quadruples down on and says, yes, I am all that plus much, much more, okay? So that's where we're at today. Now let's look at verse 25. Verse 25 through verse 30 today. Truly, truly, I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out those who may have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection 
of judgment. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we acknowledge that you indeed are our God. You are our Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you for giving us your words that we can study, that we can learn, that we can focus on today. Help us to see more and more clearly, Lord, who Jesus is and that he is indeed the God the Son, who is God incarnate, who is the author of life, the giver of life, both physically and spiritually. And to him we owe everything. We owe him our physical life. We owe him our salvation and we owe him, of course, our resurrection life that will come one day as well. God, we thank you that we can rest in knowing and believing in Jesus Christ for our salvation, that our sins have been paid for, they have been atoned for, that we have been forgiven, and we can take great rest in knowing that the final judge of us is the very one who has died for us as well. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, well, if you look back at verse 25, uh, you're going to see a lot of similarities. If you were here last week, you're going to see a lot of similarities in today's sermon because Jesus kind of takes these headings that he, he throws out there in the last passages we looked at and expounds upon them further today. So I don't want to say this, but if you missed last Sunday, you're going to catch up quickly today. All right, but in general, don't be missing. All right, now verse 25, though, he starts off with a truly, truly and you'll see this throughout the New Testament when Jesus speaks. Oftentimes, he'll repeat the word, and, and I'm going to kind of repeat what we talked about last week, okay? He says, truly, truly, why does he say this? Everything Jesus, does Jesus ever say anything that is not true or a little bit less true on one day than another day? And the answer is no, all right? Every word Jesus says is absolutely perfect. He obeys his heavenly Father perfectly. So everything he says is absolute truth. So why does the absolute truth incarnate need to say truly, truly? It's not for his own good, but it's for the good of those who are listening. And in the Hebrew language, it is a way to bring something to the superlative, all right? So it'd be, uh, you could say something like, uh, well, I gave that example last week in Arkansas, good, gooder, and goodest, all right? That's kind of the way we do superlatives there. Uh, but there's better ways to do that. But in the Hebrew language, this was it. You would repeat it twice. Uh, there in the Bible, you have, you have a super, super superlative, I believe two times. You may correct me. At this I didn't really study for that today, but uh, an attribute of God that's repeated three times, right? What is that? It comes to my holy, 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 right? Isaiah and Revelation as well, you have that. Holy, 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 and everyone remembers R.C. Sproul's sermons on that and the holiness of God, and it's just beautiful. It's like he is beyond holy, beyond holy, beyond holy, he is super holy. All right, so when Jesus says truly, truly, he is making sure that they are with him, and he's about to really increase the intensity of a point that he wants them to hear. Everything he says before this, after this, is equally true, but it's a way of saying, Listen in, truly, truly, all right? So what is this point going to be? Continue on. I say to you, an hour is coming and is now here when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. Now, this is, this is interesting. Now, we, we start off, <clears throat> just look back, verse 25, we'll note that Jesus, this is important to note because there's going to be a change in what he who he ascribes himself to be in the passage we're going to look at today. All right, uh, so far, he is ascribing to himself that he is the Son of God. Now, we might think that that is, would be the most common title for Jesus to refer to him as. Uh, John 20, verse 31, we have that great purpose statement by the Apostle John, who says, but these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And so it, you think by that being the purpose statement, he'll probably, Jesus will refer to himself as the son of God most often, but he does not. Instead, he'll change here in just a moment to what we see is the most common self-ascribed title of Jesus. And it's not the son of God, it is the son of man, all right? And we'll get to why that is in just a moment. All right, so here we have in verse 25, he says, the hour is coming, and is now here, uh, when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God, and those who hear will live. Now, in this section that we're going to cover today, Jesus is going to be talking about spiritual life, raising people from the dead spiritually, and he's going to be talking about raising people 
from their dead bodies finally and fully in the ultimate resurrection. And you could say you have both resurrections here. You have the spiritual resurrection where God speaks to your dead soul and brings you to life. And they also are going to have this physical resurrection where who is doing this? Who can do such a thing? It's going to be the Son of God who calls out the dead. So now, which one is he talking about here? Is he talking about raising bodies from the dead? Or is he talking about bringing spirits from the dead? Bringing salvation, all right? And if you look back at verse 24 and verse 25 together, I think it adds clarity to it. He says in verse 24, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. And if you carry that on down into verse 25, it definitely appears that he's still talking about this new spiritual eternal life that we have. And if you look back on verse 24, we noted this last week, but uh, when, do, when do you as a believer have eternal life? Is it something that you will have or something that you do have now? And if you look back at verse 24, Jesus says, whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. If you are a believer and you have believed in Jesus Christ for your salvation, you have eternal life. You go directly into, into life in the presence of Jesus Christ, but there is no in-between. Your body will stay here. We'll cover that in a moment, but you have eternal life. And one day, of course, you'll be reunited with the body, a better body, a glorified body. Now, he goes on to say in verse 24, uh, he does not come into judgment but has passed from death to life. This is huge. So this is what many would call the first resurrection. You could call it regeneration. Uh, this is you going from spiritually dead to spiritually alive. And what did you do to bring yourself to such a position? Well, pat yourself on the back because you did nothing. All right. Uh, don't pat yourself on the back. This is a monergistic work of God, one energy working, and it is God. God is doing this. He brings us to life. We looked at Ephesians 2 last week, right? It said, you once were spiritually dead. How far does a dead person move? Not at all. And what happened to make you come alive spiritually? You follow on down Ephesians chapter 2, God made you alive. And so here we're doing the same thing. Now, all this is in context of, again, the man being healed after 38 years being paralyzed, uh, Jesus speaking to him, get up, take your mat, and walk. And what does the man do? He does that. Uh, what did he contribute to that? Nothing. And this is the point. What, do you, <clears throat> what did you bring? Uh, what did you do to bring yourself from spiritual death to spiritual life? And the point is nothing. And then Jesus is talking about spiritual life, physical life, all here in this passage. What did that man do to bring himself back to life? Nothing. Uh, Jesus did that. He restored him to some degree. He, he gave him back his physical life. He spoke, and that happened. That's who Jesus is, all right? So look at verse 26. Let's continue on. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself, all right? So once again, Father has life in himself. That's non-controversial, we looked at that a little bit last week. The Old Testament, the Pharisees who have no trouble ascribing to, to God as being the author of life. You go back to the book of Genesis, right? In the beginning, God. And God created everything. Everything that was, was there was nothing else alive. God spoke life into existence. Plants came alive, right? Because God spoke. Uh, creatures are, have life because God speaks that life. God speaks life, breathes life into Adam, right? God is the author of life. He has life within himself, which goes against totally our, the current worldview of saying uh, evolution somehow came and all animals came from non-life. Uh, what do you get from non-life? More non-life, all right? It goes against the laws of science. As Christians, we acknowledge what Jesus says right here, my father has life within himself, he is, he is not, uh, he, is a, he is a, has a saity. He is in self-existence. He has life within himself. He received this life from no one like you and I did. If you're here today, you've received this life 
from mom and dad, all right? Uh, but not God. He has life within himself. So they had no pro problem with this, no trouble with this at all. But what they do have trouble with is verse 26. He says, so he has granted the son also to have life in himself. Now, we covered this again last week. I told you there'd be lots of repetition. But here you see again this functional uh, subordination, functional subordination. Um, I believe D, um, uh, Carson uses a functional subordination. I believe R.C. Sproul uses uh, economic subordination, all right? And the point of this is, if you look at verse 26, well, actually go back. Let's, let's trace it down because you have it a lot in chapter 5. Look at verse 19 quickly. Uh, so Jesus said to them, truly, truly, I say to you, the son can do nothing of his own accord, but only what he sees the father doing. All right, there's one example of this, functional subordinationism. Do these passages mean that Jesus is less God than God the Father? Absolutely not. This does not mean that he is any less than God the Father. But there is a functional or economic or working out within the Trinity of subordination. And so you see this in verse 19. Uh, go down to verse 20, you'll see it again, where the Father uh, ha grants or shows, verse 20, for the Father loves the Son and shows him all that he himself is doing, and greater works than these will he show him so that you may marvel. Again, the Father is doing this, all right, through the Son. Look at verse 22. Another one, the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. So you see this functional subordination to the Father, okay? It in no way lessens the essence, the being of Jesus as the Son of God. But you see the subordination there. Some cults will look at this and say, see, Jesus is not fully God. So you need to have an answer for that. That's when you pull up your notes from way back in June of 2023 and go, functional subordination is my answer to that, all right? And they're going to be like, wow, that's impressive. Wow. All right, so that's so he is not saying that he is less than God here, all right? But there is this subordination there. Uh, now, in verse 26, <clears throat> Father has life in himself. Who else has life in himself? It's Jesus. Jesus is saying that I, the Son, have life in myself. In, it's like, so not only is he, can he work on the Sabbath day because God the Father is working on the Sabbath day, but he is the, he is the giver. Or he can restore someone to physical life. He is the one who speaks and gives you spiritual life as well. And he possesses in his being the ability to give life. This is huge. Again, the Pharisees have no trouble saying, yes, God the Father, Yahweh has these, Jehovah, he, he has this. He possesses, he is the author of life and can restore life as he did for someone there with Elijah, someone there with Elijah brought them back from the dead. But now you're saying that you can do this? And that's exactly what Jesus is saying. Uh, look at verse 27. And he has given <clears throat> him authority. He there is God the Father, him is Jesus. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Now this is what we're talking about earlier. Like he introduced, he, first he mentions to, him, mentions to them there in verse uh, 25, uh, that he is the son of God, all right? That's only going to be used three times in the entire book of John. Instead, this is the term, the most common self-ascribed term that he's going to refer to him as. He'll refer to himself as the son of man. And you're, this is really important, and we're going to expound on this a bit, a bit, but you'll see that the son of man is often connected to judgment. Now look at verse 27 again. And he, God the Father, has given him, the Son, uh, authority to execute judgment. Again, you have this functional subordination, all right? God the Father has given him this uh, because he is the Son of Man. Now, which one is he? Is he the Son of God in verse 25, or is he the Son of Man over here in verse 27? And don't answer out loud one or the other because he is both, all right? He is both of those. Each title's Teach us something different about the person of Jesus Christ. Uh, he is fully God. He is fully man as well. But more than just emphasizing the humanity of Jesus here, this is meaning something else. This is a, a title that we get from Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14. Let's look over there. 
Go ahead and start turning. It may take you a moment. Most of your Bibles don't open to Daniel. They still open to Hebrews if you've been here for a while. But uh, Daniel chapter 7. Feel free to use the accord, concordance if you'd like to. All right, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 and 14, it's a really unique passage that uh, the, the Jews really could never fully wrap their mind around. Uh, it is definitely the revelation of God, uh, but it's not expounded on or clarified on until later. And Jesus picks up this title and really clarifies it a lot through the teaching of the New Testament, even into the book of Revelation as well. But in Daniel chapter 7, <clears throat> It's a fascinating passage where you have one who is like a man, like a son of man, before the Ancient of Days, which is God the Father, and, and the Ancient of Days ascribes, gives to him, like we've been seeing in John chapter 5, uh, power, dominion, authority as well. And before I give it all away, let's just read it. Verse 13, I saw in the night visions... And behold, the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man, and he came to the ancient of days, and he was presented before him, and to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom one that shall not pass be destroyed okay now this is a perplexing passage <clears throat> they uh, the jews obviously were monotheistic they believed in one god but here this fascinating passage you have one who is like a son of man before the ancient of days and you have the ancient of days god the father who is giving the attributes of God, the full, the, what only God the Father put, could possess, or only God could possess, to this other one who is like a man. Uh, how can a man, right, receive glory? Uh, if you think back to look at verse 14, uh, why would God the Father give the right to a man to receive glory in a kingdom that all people, all nations and languages should serve him? Uh, his dominion is an everlasting dominion. So there's something going on here that this is more than just a man, but the one standing before the Ancient of Days is definitely like a son of man. Now, this passage is quite perplexing, but here we'll start unfolding it, unpacking it as we go through the book of John, and I think you'll see it even more clearly. Uh, did Jesus? Here, here's an interesting question. <clears throat> did Jesus always have power dominion, and glory? And that's an interesting question, all right? Uh, as God the Son from all of eternity, he has. Uh, but what makes this passage unique is that now you have it granted to who one who is the Son of Man. So did, did God the Son always have flesh? Was he always human as well? And the answer to that is, of course, no, right? We see that the Holy Spirit came upon Mary, and she conceived a one who, uh, who, is, who, who is Jesus, right? Who is the Son of God, but he's also the Son of Man. Uh, Jesus died on the cross. He rose from the dead. Where is his body now? He ascended with that flesh, with that body, into heaven. So now you have one, like a Son of Man, who has all dominion, all power, all kingdoms will serve him, in the flesh, all right? So you have this Daniel passage that Jesus is revealing, look, I am the Son of God. I am also the Son of Man. Look back at verse 27. And he has given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Now this passage is <clears throat> very interesting, again, because you have this one who has the physical likeness of a man, Daniel is saying, like a son of man, before God. And you think back to like Isaiah chapter 6, speaking of the holiness of God, uh, what did Isaiah do when he just caught a glimpse of the glory of God? He says, I am undone. I am undone. Well, he cast a curse on himself. He says, woe is me. I'm coming undone. That is the natural tendency of a sinful person before God, 
But here in Daniel 7, this Ancient of Days, God is, is ascribing to the one like a son of man with full glory, right? Uh, if you go to John chapter 17, verse 5, sorry, John chapter 17, verse 5, right? Jesus prays, I want to be back in your glory as I had before he came to earth. And he's going to go back into that glory, and he'll receive that glory fully, but with his humanness as well. Uh, also in this, this Son of Man title, it's hard for me to ever use Daniel chapter 7 without going over to Matthew uh, 26. So turn over there with me, Matthew 26, 63 through 66. And what he, Jesus begins to, to get out there at this point in John chapter 5, that he is the Son of Man. He is, this is something that they understood what he was saying. But you see very clearly that the Jews, the high priest, Caiaphas, understood fully when Jesus referred to himself as the Son of Man. Look at this. Jesus has already been arrested. He's standing on his, um, uh, what do they call it, the kangaroo court. He's before the, the kangaroo court there, the false court, the, the high priest is called. And, uh, and here you have the high priest and Jesus interacting. Let's see what he says. But Jesus remained silent, and the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God, tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. All right, there you have that title, the Son of God. Verse 64, Jesus said to him, you have said so, so he's correct, uh, but I tell you from now on you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of judgment. Now to us, we're like, okay, that's, I, I mean, that's, what's, is that, is that going to cause a big effect? Maybe not, maybe so, I don't really know. Look at verse 65, then the high priest tore his robes and said, he has uttered blasphemy. What further witness do we need? You have now heard this blasphemy. What is your judgment? And they answered, he deserves death. Wow. How did that? Of course, they hated him. They wanted to kill him. But what did he say that triggered the robes being ripped off and this huge dramatic display of anger and passion against Jesus? He claimed to be the son of man from Daniel 7, verse 14. Uh, he says, this is who I am. I am the Son of Man. And look back at 714. If you, if you already moved on, that's fine. Uh, but verse 13 said, I saw in the night visions, and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a Son of Man. With the clouds of heaven, there came one like a Son of Man. All right? Jesus here, look what he says. But I tell you, from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. This is, this is direct. He is saying the Son of Man has, has all dominion, all power, all authority, who is going to reign and rule and truly be the ultimate judge. That's me. That is who I am. And what does this high priest do? It's always fascinating. You have the earthly high priest and the ultimate high priest right there on the spot. And you have the earthly high priest judging the true high priest. And you have the ultimate judge being judged by this earthly high priest. The earthly high priest says you deserve to die, okay? Now, this phrase, <coughs> coming on the clouds, is interesting because you saw it there in Daniel 13. Uh, you see it here when he's talking to Caiaphas, the high priest, uh, back there in verse 64 on Matthew 26. He says, I tell you from now on, you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Coming on the clouds is an Old Testament way of speaking divine judgment, all right? The divine judgment of God is coming. Uh, if you, I've got a couple of passages here to kind of explore that just quickly with you. But Joel chapter 2, I believe I have these highlighted for you, a hard book to look up. Joel chapter 2, verse 1 through 2, it says, Blow a trumpet, and this is the judgment over Judah. Blow a trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm on my holy mountain, let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming, it is near. A day of darkness and gloom, and a day of clouds and thick darkness. So when the clouds are mentioned, it means divine judgment. And so when Jesus says, from now on, you will see me on the at the right hand of power and the, on the clouds, he's not talking, oftentimes we, we see cartoons, right, where they they have the, the clouds in heaven or, or the, the different depictions of Jesus in these pretty clouds. And, 
is coming down all nice and peaceful, et cetera. And it's uh, a horrible depictions of Jesus, by the way. Don't ever stare at those very long. And, uh, but it's, it's, just, it's just this very calm, very peaceful. And yet the clouds represent judgment. And that's why Caiaphas is like, I'm going to kill you. You're threatening me with judgment. I am the judge of Israel. And Jesus is saying, you're about to see who the real judge is. All right? Look at Lamentations 2, verse 1. This one's up here as well. Uh, God's announcement of judgment over Israel. Notice the use of cloud. How the Lord in his anger has set the daughter of Zion under a cloud. This does not mean that they're expecting rain that day. All right? It is apocalyptic language of divine judgment that is going to come from God. He goes on to say, He has cast down from heaven to earth the splendor of Israel. He has not remembered his footstool in the day of his anger. The clouds of judgment, all right? And we see that's what Jesus is speaking about. He is the Son of Man. So when Jesus referenced the Son of Man, calls himself the Son of Man, he is ascribing that he is the one in Daniel 17 who receives all of this and also that he's coming on those clouds. That means that he is the final, divine, ultimate judge. Look at Revelation. Now, turn with me over there. Hold your place in John if you're not in John, go back to John 5 and one finger and turn to Revelation chapter 1. Uh, Revel the book of Revelation obviously is a, a very interesting book to study. And if you've studied it much, it's really important to note that lots of the language comes from apocalyptic language in the Old Testament. And it's very similar so just one example of this, okay? We notice the clouds in Daniel 7, all right? We notice the clouds over here in, in these other passages where God is speaking judgment. I'm coming on the clouds, right? My anger is coming. Uh, in Revelation 1, 4 through 7, we see a New Testament example of God using these clouds in, in judgment, but it's in the New Testament. And Revelation borrows heavily with apocalyptic language. And to best understand the book of Revelation, you really need to understand Old Testament use of this language. But follow with me on verse 4 through 7. John said to the seven, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father, to him be glory, dominion forever and ever. Amen. Now look at verse 7. Behold, he is coming. Who is the he? It's Jesus. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will well on account of him. Even so, amen. Wow. So you look back at verse 7. Who is this coming on the clouds? <clears throat> and does it look like it's going to be a nice, pretty picture of him coming on those clouds? No. The, every tribe on earth is going to well on account of him. Uh, even, look back earlier, even those who pierced him. Most likely a reference back to Caiaphas, right? Caiaphas said, from now on, you will see me coming on the clouds at the right hand of power in judgment, all right? So the clouds, the Son of Man, judgment, all of that is going together. And that takes us back to John chapter 5. Go back to John chapter 5. <clears throat> John chapter 5, we see that that is certainly what it's about. It is about judgment and who is going to be doing this judgment? It is the Son of Man. Who is the Son of Man? It's Jesus. It's God in the flesh. All right? Um, let's see. Look at uh, what is their response going to be after Jesus says all this to them. Uh, look at verse 28. They are going to marvel. Uh, they're kind of stupefied. It says, do not marvel at this, is what Jesus tells the Pharisees. For an hour is coming when all who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out, and those who have done good to the resurrection of life, and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So he does not back down. As again, I'm saying he's double downing, triple downing, quadruple downing. He's going further and further. This is who I am. 
I have the power over physical life, over spiritual life, and also it is my voice that will speak and cause all who are dead to rise again. Like that's, that's huge, right? This is huge. Uh, who gets raised from the dead? If we look back at this passage, is he talking about believers only or is it everyone? Does everyone get raised from the dead or do only believers get raised from the dead? And uh, look back at the verse here, verse 28. It's very self-explanatory. Do not marvel at this, for an hour is coming when all uh, who are in the tombs will hear his voice and come out. And it's not just believers, because he uh, explains that in verse 29. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment. So that there is a day when Jesus will speak and again, in context of what was happening here with, with, with raising this 38-year uh, paralyzed man very, in a similar-ish way, uh, Jesus spoke and he came to life, right? Uh, from, from completely crippled to fully restored. But in a, in a much better, bigger, grander, grandiose way, Jesus will speak and all dead bodies will come to life. All, and then there is a great division on the, upon this judgment. And who is going to be the judge? It's going to be Jesus Christ. Uh, verse, uh, the end of verse 29 there, there's a great division. Some will be raised to the resurrection of life. Those are those who have eternal life. You have eternal life now. You go directly into the presence of God. Your body stays here. The voice will come forth, and your body will come forth, and you will be reunited with your soul in a glorified body where there is no pain, there is no suffering, there is no death, there are no tears, there's no sorrow, right? If we fast forward to the end of the book of Revelation in the new heaven and new earth, that is going to happen. What about those who are unbelievers? Will they be raised from the dead as well? We don't focus on that a lot of times, but if you look back at Jesus' words, the answer is yes, they will be. You will have a glorified body to be made perfectly <clears throat> to glorify God in the presence of God. Others will be raised, their bodies will be raised, and they will be reunited with their soul, and they will made, be made perfect for the receiving eternal wrath of God for their sins, all right? So this is all one time Jesus speaks. The final uh, eternal destinations are fully then experienced. Right now, if you're to, a person dies, there is a, a version of that where they go to, but if you fast forward to the book of Revelation, we see, of course, there's an ultimate, uh, you, you can call it heaven. Uh, God's dwelling place is now with man, new heaven, new earth. We also see the final judgment and the final uh, lake of fire as well, all right? So those things are, are, are the, the ultimate end, but, but the main point here is Jesus, the Son of Man, is claiming that he is the one who will call people forth from every tribe, every nation all around the world, those who have been dead for forever, and he will call them forth, and there will be great judgment, eternal life, and eternal death. All right? Look at Acts 24, verse 14 through 15. A few of the passages just to look at <clears throat> and to help expose and help show that there is a resurrection of both those who are saved and those who are unsaved. Acts 24, verse 14 through 15. This is Paul speaking, but Paul is clarifying this and making the same point. In verse 14, he says, But this I confess to you, that according to the way, that's uh, the name of Christianity at that time, which they call a sect, I worship the God of our fathers, believing everything laid down by the law and written in the prophets, having a hope in God, which these men themselves accept, and there will be a resurrection of both the just and and the unjust. So here we have it, right? <clears throat> what is he talking about? He is talking about this final resurrection that Jesus has talked about here in John chapter 5. We'll talk about elsewhere. There is a singular resurrection. There is a voice that goes out from Jesus Christ. All who are dead are raised, and it's just and unjust. It is, as verse 28 in uh, uh, John chapter 5 said, those who, are, who have done evil to the resurrection of judgment, those who have done good to the resurrection of life. 
Uh, another good, good one to go to is 2 Thessalonians. Turn over there, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And I have verse 7b, that just means skip over a little bit and get to, to, get to, uh, to, the, to the second little section there of the verse 7. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, 7b through 9. <clears throat> Starts with the word when. All right, 2 Thessalonians 1, 7b through 9, starting with the word when. When the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven and with his mighty angels in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might, when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed, because our testimony to you was believed. So here we have again, just, just echoing what we've looked at so far, <clears throat> on the same day that Jesus comes and the same moment that Jesus comes, there is both vengeance, there is fire, there is judgment, there is punishment, there is eternal destruction, but also, look at verse 10, when he comes on that day, this is all happening at the same time. Uh, and reinterpreting this according to John chapter 5, when he comes on that day, same day, to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you uh, was believed. So you have this final, ultimate, supreme resurrection. The voice goes out, bodies are reunited, there is judgment, there is eternal wrath, there is eternal life, okay? And all of this is done by Jesus Christ. And what do you need to do? You need to believe in who? Jesus Christ. Uh, turn quickly over to Matthew chapter 25. You looked at this in discipleship <clears throat> last week, so I'm not going to belabor it, but Matthew chapter 25, look at verse 31 through 34, and you're just going to skip through this section kind of quickly since you looked at it so much last week. Matthew chapter 25. On the final judgment, okay? And there, in this final judgment, uh, and you might, might see the screen above me here, I'm just going to hit verse 31 through 34, skip to verse 41, and then skip to verse 46. The whole thing is good. You looked at it last week, I hope, uh, but I'm just going to fast forward a little bit again, seeing, seeing this final judgment, okay? And the Son of Man, how this is coming together. Look what he says in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory... And all the angels with him, he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but on the goat, the goats on the left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Now look at verse 41. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me. You cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. Look at verse 46. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. All right, so, so this again, the final ultimate judgment. Look at the title that Jesus describes of himself. He doesn't use son of God. He doesn't look, look back at verse 31. He doesn't say when the son of God comes in his glory. He's talking about judgment and who has the right to judge. According to Daniel 7, the Son of Man is the one who comes on the clouds, who is given all authority, dominion, and power, who is going to judge. So here you have Jesus. And this is what we looked at last week. Jesus says, if you don't honor the Son, you, you can't honor the Father. You have to honor the Son. And what do people do? So, so many people say, oh, I believe in God. I just don't believe in Jesus. Then you're not saved. Uh, you, are not, you do not have eternal life. You will not go into eternal life. You are not going into heaven, all right? You must believe in the one Savior that God has sent because also to him, he has granted the power to judge and who will judge all mankind. Now, thinking back over to these verses, how many judgments are there according to these passages? There's one. There's one great judgment, okay? How many options are there for eternity? Uh, there's only two. <clears throat> there's nowhere in between. It's eternal wrath or it's eternal life. And that's it. 
There is nothing in between. So many people today say, well, I'm pretty good, and I might not make it to the best heaven or something, but I'll get somewhere near, you know, and I'll be okay. No, it's eternal life or it's eternal wrath. Uh, there is no purgatory, you know, something that was created hundreds of years ago. It's kind of an in-between, maybe where, okay, they didn't, they didn't do too well here, but they'll go there, and they'll be purged of their sin, and they'll, they'll receive some punishment, kind of a heavenish, hellish thing, right, until they're eventually cleansed of those sins, and then they get to go, there's nothing like that, all right? It is eternal wrath. It is eternal life. You as a believer have eternal life. You go immediately into the presence of God. And it gets, it, it's in his glory. If you have not believed, you have eternal wrath. And that is it. Uh, according to these passages we looked at, is there a second chance in the afterlife? Uh, is there a way once you die, you can still make things right, you know? Uh, maybe there's like a second chance, you know? I'll talk God into seeing things my way or whatever you, your person might say these days. Is there a second chance after we die? And the answer is absolutely not, right? Uh, another one we can want to look at, turn to Revelation 20, verse 11 through 15. This, was, this is what Jesus is saying. Once you are dead, all these passages we just looked at, it is over. And we get to Revelation 20, verse 11 through 15. Uh, we see that people are judged for what they did while they were alive. Very similar to Matthew 25. All right, Jesus is there. He's separated out in the sheep and goats. Uh, the, the agricultural analogy that's similar to, to in that day, they could easily see these things, but he's going to do this to all mankind one day. Sheep and goats. And, they're, and Jesus knows their behavior. If you are a true Christian, your behavior should match your profession, okay? And so you should be living and acting like a Christian. Uh, if you're not, then this is exposing who you are, and you're, you're a goat, not a sheep. Okay, Revelation 20, verse 11, 15. I just kind of want you to look at the, the finality of this. Whatever they did on earth, that's it. There is nothing in between that they, they can change. Uh, then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. And from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and there was no place to be found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and the books were open. Then another book was open, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Now pause right there just for a moment. This is great in the context of the passage we've been looking at. Over to John chapter 5. Jesus, the Son of Man, is going to speak, and all are going to be resurrected. Those who are just and unjust those to eternal life, and those to eternal damnation as well, eternal death. This is what he's saying here. The voice goes forth, the bodies, no matter if they're in the sea, no matter where they're at, no matter what happened to them, they're coming forth, all right? And they were judged according to what they had done. Uh, every deed is recorded by God. And uh, the, the, the metaphor here is that their books are opened, right? Not that, that God has to have a book and record everything and look back at his notes, but it's a way of speaking that everything these people did while on earth is before God. Every wrong, every sinful thought, every sinful word, every sinful deed, and they are about to be exposed to the one that earth and sky have fled from, and they are laid bare with their sins. Think back to Adam and Eve. They sinned what some would say, oh, they're just a little sin, right? And yet God comes and they are horrified. Uh, you think of Isaiah, who was the best of, best of Israel, had to offer, and he's, he cannot stand. He's come undone in the presence of a holy God. Here on the day of judgment, you have sinners fully exposed, nowhere to go, no bushes to hide from, earth is gone, sky is gone, and it's just sinful man before God. This is horrifying, and there's no escape, the judgment of God. And who is this judge? It's the Son of Man. It's, it's, it's Jesus Christ who is the ultimate judge. Now, look at verse 14. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. 
We have the other book here that is, is the, uh, the one containing names only. And that, that's a fascinating point. You have, you have the, the book that has all the information of those who have sinned against Christ and not believed, and they are judged for their sins. They died with their sins. Their sins are perfectly recorded for, by God. Not one sin will be overlooked. They have no forgiveness, no mercy, no grace. But yet, the believers, what, what do we have? Another book was opened. This is the book of life. And there's nothing about the deeds, nothing about the, what we've done. And it's an interesting way that John looks at this. It's we are judged how? On Christ's perfections. Jesus is perfectly obedient. The only way for us to get to heaven is we would have to be perfectly obedient. The good news of the gospel is that while we can't, Jesus Christ did. And it's his perfect record that gets us to heaven. So the book is opened up for you to be judged on the final day, and it's just your name. This is a beautiful thing. Who took your sins? Why are they not there? Jesus Christ has truly paid it all. So you have the judge who is the very same one who also died on the cross for your sins. So this is a beautiful, beautiful place of comfort for the believer to think upon these things. Uh, the one who is going to judge is the one who paid for our sins. He paid for all of our sins. I have eternal life. I will face the judge, but my name is in the book. This is wonderful peace for the believer. A Christian can take comfort in knowing that their final judge is the one who has saved them from sin and the eternal wrath that their sins deserved. And uh, we'll stop there for today. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the beauty of your word. And we thank you that, that as a believer, we can rest fully in knowing that our sins have been erased, they are forgiven, they are atoned for, and that the one who is our ultimate judge is also the one who is our Savior, who has saved us from sin and saved us from the wrath and curse that we deserve. And God, we pray if there's anyone here today or listening that has not believed, that was thinking they're going to get to heaven some other way, may they see that there is no way to get to heaven except through Jesus Christ. As Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. God, help, us, help them to see that. Open their eyes up. Bring them from death to life, we pray. Give them eternal life, Lord. And uh, God, help us as believers to get this good news out. Help us not to keep it a secret. Help us not to keep it locked in our own minds, and in our own hearts, but help us to have a passion to let other people know heaven is real, hell is real, uh, there is, God is holy, there is going to be an ultimate judgment. You have sinned, but the good news is that God has sent the Savior for your sin. He is the Son of God. He is the Son of Man. He is the Christ. And by believing in his name,